All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, spending some time of their day with us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about mainframe integration. Um, it's been something that's going on for quite a while. Um, we've had some experience here at GT of helping organizations handle their challenges. So we're going to try to identify some of them uh, in case you ran into them and uh, also some of our user stories on how they were able to modernize their mainframe. As we all know that the mainframe is the system of record for um, all different uh, types of applications, be it manufacturing, finance, banks especially, um, and some airlines. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, them today, uh, particularly the banks insurance and the airlines. Uh, we'll see what, uh, see here that there is some information that everybody says mainframes are dead, however, um, Fortune 500 companies, a uh, high percentage of them use their mainframes. And if anybody ever used a credit card, uh, there's an 87% chance it went through a mainframe as well as the, um, the 300 billion business transactions a day. Uh, interesting enough, uh, as of two years ago, this was um, documented that 92 of the world's 100 banks will continue to use their mainframe. So today's business needs, what do we need to do to API enable the mainframe and allow um, the front ends, whether it be a mobile device, a web service, um, tablet, phone, whatever, to access the mainframe? You can do it with, a, um, like I said, web service, a BYOD, and you allow real-time access to the data from, from any platform. You can access the mainframe data. So we talked to quite a few of our customers and, and, and we talked to them and they said, we're doing Kix API ready. Yeah, but we asked them how they're doing it and what kind of issues they're having and what problems they're having. So during the, the discussions, we found there's lots of war stories um, and lessons learned. And basically it's a, a trial and, and, and error scenario where they try and they fail, they try and they fail, try and they fail. And finally, uh, they have some success. Another thing that we hear all the time is, hey, we have an ESB, we can do all that. But are they really, and, and do the, the ESB handle all their needs? This is what we, the older version of what we call an ESB. And as you can see, that there's a common environment and the clients and the interest in systems, they either register in the bus and they can push things to or they can pull things off of. And as you see, there's lots of things on here. There's BPM, ERP, mobile apps, stuff like that. But we're going to concentrate uh, on the green on the bottom, which is the legacy systems. And that's where, that's where we have um, applications going to the mainframe. And there's more to the mainframe than just RESTful or subservices. Uh, there's things that don't fit well into the API world. You know, things like uh, 3270. Uh, conversational transactions, um, database access with JDBC. Uh, we found out that the mainframe is different and it doesn't always fit into what we consider the normal AS, AESB environment. They said they had an ESB, but does, does it do all of what they want? So what they meant is that they have some software packages embedded into the system that has an ESB, but it doesn't cover anything, everything. All right, now what do we need to consider when we talk about um, APIs and, and modernizing the mainframe, integrating the mainframe? Well, here's some questions you think. How old are your legacy backend applications and what technology are they using? Uh, legacy also depends on your definition. Uh, one of our recent customers we're working with, the last time that one of the programs that we're working with was changed was 1979. That would definitely be considered legacy. But isn't legacy anything that basics in production? So you have, you have to understand what their, their back-end applications are doing. There's also some uh, embedded technologies, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the application's code. Is it structured code? Is it unstructured code? 
And if it's structured, is it designed to have programs called other programs, the subroutine? And when you expose them, you have to have other considerations, like when there's a program call or calls you may not be able to API enable the third program without running through the sequence of the first two. Or how about the um, applications that started off as commercial offerings? How extensively are they modified? They're no longer commercial offering. I was at one uh, organization uh, probably about uh, 18, 19 years ago, where we had two commercial offerings of uh, APPO system and also of a warehousing system that were so heavily modified that the vendor basically stopped supporting them and, and just gave the company the code, sold the company the code, so it was self-supported. How do you handle that? Do you have somebody to support it? What if the coding philosophies changed? Maybe, maybe you use something like a case tool, and then you went and, and did it yourself, and, and those philosophies are a little bit different. What about uh, third-party components? All right, um, they're not, they're, they're, you're not aware of embedded code. Some of these APIs might not work because you need to call that embedded code in a certain sequence. And how complex? You know, programmers take shortcuts, all right? So maybe you have a copy book with no O1 level, it's defined with 20K bytes, and then another copy book or within the same copy book, it redefines the first 10,000 bytes, and then another time in the same program, redefines the 5,000 bytes. How do you handle that? It's even messier when the redefines can change the data type. You know, what, what if, the, if the first initial definition was a character and then it redefines it as numeric? How do you handle that in your API? And does your staff who, who creates the APIs fully understand what the application does? I mean, customers can expose a program or a series of programs that are they're told that, hey, do this. But what happens when there's little nuances that the customer knows better and the person developing the API doesn't? So sometimes you need a discovery tool, too, to map out the integration relationships between the programs, transactions, data. Um, Okay, we're, we're, right now we're working with um, one customer. We talked about different standards. We're working with a customer that had four different ones in their code. They use a case tool, and then the input, and, and then the other groups wrote them a different way. The input, input behavior looks okay, but maybe the processing isn't the same. So, the old, the old 3270 user out dialogues, you come to a menu, you pick a function, you go into the data return from that function. Now you need to create an intelligent, an intelligent API to handle that functionality and go after the data that you require. What we want to do is we want to make the back, back end systems transparent. A program that was many, written many years ago can also interact with a terminal or a program calls, should not need to know that it's now being called from an API or a UI running on a mobile or a tablet. And if you have to write code to drive your, to drive your uh, APIs, you're now adding more level of complexity and more support requirements. How, how would you like to expose a Kicks transaction without having to change any source code or having to create any code and also not have to change the transaction behavior? Now today, today you hear about microservices and fine-grained APIs or atomic APIs. <clears throat> and that as they, while they may be easier to build, they may not be what you need. You can, put, you can put more work on the consumer when you create only microservices or, API, or atomic APIs. What we like to do is create more intelligent APIs to reduce or eliminate the consumer side logic. As an example, in a banking application, you can have different microservices for different accounts, one for checking, one for savings, 401k, loans, mortgage, et cetera but they're only microservices. So if you only create them, you're gonna put the onus of consolidating them on the front end UIs of the, or the Java or .NET programmers in the front end. And they're gonna to have to take all those, call four times, take all those and consolidate them into a single response to the user. But what if you could take that, those APIs and consolidate them 
before they go back to the front end. That way you have a composite view of the microservices that can return to the consumer. And they only have to call a single API. It uh, saves on support efforts and programming efforts on the front end. And it gives you a single point where you can make changes if necessary. Now, legacy mainframe applications uh, looks like it's a box of chocolate, and that's the, the picture on the right-hand side. Because you really don't know what's inside either a box of chocolates or the mainframe apps until you go and, and look at it. And it's hard to see from just the outside looking in. You have to dig deep. Some of the examples that um, we have for complexities, are, some may be more prevalent to IMS, but I wanted to make, make everybody aware of them. Uh, Kicks and IMS and a lot of the organizations tend to uh, cohabitate. But a picture of the Kicks transaction on the right-hand side is very simple. Simple example that you realize that many transactions are much more complex and have many more threads uh, from the from the transaction to different resources. Start a transaction, pass control to other programs or calls other programs, and needs to run the flow. You may not even know this is happening as you're running the transaction normally, but you will when you try the behavior of the API. You, you may need to run them in the same sequence. You have some 3270 process, processing that allows for multiple inputs or outputs. Or, you know, the first screen, you hit PA1, you start to scroll, et cetera. How do you handle that back to the front end? It would be nice to be able to gather that and pass all the data back to the front end in, the first, in one single stream rather than the front end trying to figure out how to basically page. And then you have multi-part messages and multi-segments, all right? Uh, you can have uh, 10 segments coming back that are all different lengths, and they all use different copy books. How would that handle? It would be much easier to do that in a single point to make the con composite API than relying on the front end to handle those complexities. Or what about redefines and, and occurs depending on? You know, data that exists in what one state that can be re redefined to another state. And in my previous example, I talked about uh, being numeric at one time and character this another time. And then there's the, the issue of null terminations. Null terminations, uh, what we found at one of our sites is the data, and this particularly uh, was an IMS site, but it could happen anywhere because the data could have a uh, hex 00, zero or a hex 3f and basically MFS puts the f3x in to end the data but there's more data behind it so how, how's that handled because in ASCII world uh, in the Java world they don't understand what that is screen macros uh, BMS maps allow you to have screen macros how, how would they handle them in an API so you have to be aware of um, of where they are and what they are. What we found in, in uh, the original Zyme is that the screen macros had a zero field fields. Well, then when we, went, when we created the APIs, we didn't know that at the time. We didn't fill those, fill those fields with zeros, and therefore the API failed. Conversational programs, and this again is mostly IMS, but you can have conversational CICS programs. How would you expose that as an API? How would you have the front end basically go from transaction to transaction? And uh, it would be even easier to support, have something that would be a control and flow technology to be able to pass the required data going from transaction one to transaction two to transaction three, or each iteration of the same transaction in a conversational. And what about calling, um, what about calling APIs from from the mainframe outside. There's some requirements to call applications that are external to the customer. They could do that with a, a callable service, but also some customers can only get to their, their uh, provider through a 3270 dialog. And, I don't, and you'll be able, you should be able to do that with an API, and you can, can do that with not necessarily screen scraping, but a better way to do it through, through uh, Ivory API. Complex conversational transaction, we talked about that a little bit. Um, 
I won't go over that too much. It's, it's more of a, an IMS uh, thing. But basically, you, you want to go through TRAN, TRAN 1 to TRAN 2 TRAN 3, and you have to run them in order in order for TRAN 4 to work properly. So if you end the API prematurely, there's, not, there's a possibility that data, that update will not be committed. All right, these guys are, are trying to build applications out of Legos, and, and our salesperson um, got these slides from him. Uh, he likes his he likes his Legos for an idea because basically, some Legos can have two plugs, four plugs, etc. But the idea is that you can plug them all together because they have a common interface, common standard API. And in some cases, you want to build the APIs on top of another, other APIs. And in other cases, you are building APIs off existing APIs so you can reuse them. So in today's world, we're not creating APIs that are just mainframe. We have customers who are creating Kix APIs, Cobol APIs, Vendor, NetApp, .NET APIs, Java APIs. So there's a requirement to construct APIs from multiple platforms to create a common interface, a common experience. And you have to have this standard interface in order for all that to work. And like we said, just like the Legos, they have to be pluggable and have to have the ability to connect APIs easily. So if you think about this and look at the left, it's lines of business that are driving the, tech, the things we do today. Um, the list on the left, the web apps, COTS, mobile, et cetera. And that list will also continue to grow as, as new things like a blockchain, AI, robotic process automation uh, come into, come into uh, more use. But somewhere there's an API discovery, API processing logic that is probably discovered through an API manager. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. And they're requesting API services like the Get Check and Get Save and Get Card on that we talked about before from a simple API REST provider. And what that simple provider does, it, it provides a single input and a sim, single output. And they're usually mapped in JSON for REST, and it would map the input message, the output message, to the provider. The provider being Kix or any other tools listed and you can start thinking about doing this today and is, and is doing what you need. But with all the other possibilities out there, what if you want to manipulate the data in the API? What if you want to do some if-then-else control flow, uh, switch case uh, possibilities? What if you have an input message but can return two or more output messages? How would you differentiate between those messages coming back uh, we already talked about the possibilities like multiple input messages, conversational, variable length, structures, uh, null terminations, non-standard. But how do, you, how do you have, when you have to run multiple transactions in a particular sequence, you have to have something to do this control and flow. Um, so you can run them in, a, in the correct sequence in the API to work properly, but n not necessarily if you put the onus on the UIs to do that process by, by only using atomic APIs. Uh, but what if, what if you have to go after IDMS or natural or other systems uh, that need access as part of your API? How would you do that? And what, what all this means is that your simple API model can become very complex very quickly. If this is the case, then each consumer on the left will be responsible for handling all the complexities and that doesn't necessarily bode well. So let's take a look at what Ivory can do. Ivory can, can remove the complexity from the consumer to allow you to create an intelligent API, APIs that allow you to orchestrate not only the simple APIs, but the other situations as well, as well. The manipulation, the flow control, the multiple transactions, interactions with other applications, 3270, all that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't want to have to write code either on the provider side or on the consumer side to be able to, to do what needs to be done. So what you'll start with, start to see is more intelligent APIs, like get customer. Instead of having a, a get checking, a get savings, get car loan for the front end to call, the front end now can call get customer. All right, and, and that process will take the simple APIs, do the, do the uh, combination to composite, 
do the flow and control, and create an intelligent API that will now be published to the API manager. The consumer then can discover and call the intelligent API, and, and it'll run all the single APIs under the cover, return the consumer with a single response with all the customer data. Or if you look at the bottom of the chart where it says external services, you may be calling out to other solutions. Maybe you need data from a DVM or something in the cloud, potentially other APIs that are available externally, like a Google geocode or credit authorization. With Ivory, you can choose what you want to run the intelligent HEI process, whether it be on the mainframe, IFL, Linux, or even Windows, or you can have a hybrid solution. You need to take the complex, the consideration of all these complex situations into account when you decide how you're going to present your APIs to the front end. All right, in previous uh, environments, you wanted to move something to production. You need a KICS person, an application person, maybe a DB2 or IMS DBA, all to agree when it's going to be done. Mainframe control person, move the code along. That's changing. And what we've recently discussed, or, or discussed with the customer, they now have this environment. So you now have more than just IBM or mainframe people involved to, to integrate a KICS application because all these other areas and products need to ensure the application was moved properly. We have you know, GitHub for source control, Jenkins Automation, Linux, JBoss, WebSphere, whatever, uh, MoogSoft for distributed dashboard, Dynatrace for distributed tracing, and Urban Code for their uh, DevOps solution. So in today's world, you would need a larger variety of experts instead of just a few Kix app people that you've needed in previous years to, to move your um, application forward. Okay, here's some API lessons learned. I'm not going to delve too much into this, into these. Uh, they will be available in the slides. Um, Cobalt PM1, you have to understand the good is that you're going to support all data structures, but what if you don't support um, occurs depending on redefines or P01 about sequences? You can expose it as a service. Names in COBOL might be COBOL or P01 copybooks are very cryptic. How do you rename them? You can expose your existing programs without changes, but you may need more data to drive the app than you know. And this is just uh, a listing of uh, occurs depending on. You want to expose your transactions through REST or SOAP. Well, maybe you need multiple transactions to, cre to create what you actually need. You need data from transaction return to service output. What if the data is too large? And those type of those type of things you can run into. Combine, like I mentioned, combining transactions into one service. APIs can run for a minute. One API we created like this, they were, they were doing parts on an aircraft engine. They were changing serial numbers. But when they did that, for that one aircraft engine, one serial number, it had 10,000 parts. So when they submitted it, it's going to run for a minute or two, and they got frustrated, and they kept hitting Enter on the UI, and they ran 60,000 parts, 60,000 transactions through in a matter of minutes and couldn't understand why they weren't getting their data back right away. The other thing that uh, I want to look at is, is no code rewrite. You don't, you don't want to have to service enable or API enable or integrate your mainframe and have to write additional code to do it, whether it be COBOL, whether it be JavaScript, whether it be Node.js, whatever. It's much better and much easier to do this with no coding rewrite. And then we'll talk about the null term termination again. This is the MFS thing. And it looks something like this. That the, here's the data. But MFS throws the three fox in there after the S. That's what comes back to the uh, UI. And they don't know how to handle the three pound sign alpha two. Null termination, it just cuts off the data, even, even though there may be data that you want to use past that. All right, what's the best design methodology for your API infrastructure? How do you want to design it? Um, 
Do you want to expose each individual transaction as an API? Do you want to do that and then create smart services? And what, we, what we've done at a lot of our organizations is we've done just that. We've taken their base services and we created a service that closely matched the transaction as, as possible. And then like, like a get checking, like a get um, savings. And then when we did the composite service, the composite service would be called by the UI and that would go, that would go and run get checking, get savings, et cetera, and pass it back. In today's environment, there's more options to even call external services from COBOL. And to design this is very important and, and what you want to do to accomplish. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little later in our uh, case studies on how this is being used by some of the organizations. Here is an example of an online transaction with multiple output length messages coming back. You see it's a single transaction and it's a possibility of five known cases coming back in one unknown case. And you have to be able to handle that. And, and this is an example of how Ivy would, Ivy would handle that, uh, allowing a case switch depending on the length of the copybook coming back. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some case studies. Um, we're in the financial area. So if the kick to the system of record, uh, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with instant payment. It's in Europe now, and I believe the United States is looking at it. It's something that has been driven by the government, not driven by the banking industry, standards, companies, whatever. But what does it mean to the banks? The system must immediately call out to a payment system to reflect the payment in real time. No more waiting one or two days to update your account. It's instantly updated. Well, how are they going to do that? Okay, that, that's something that they have to look at and they have to be able to call, use an API to call out to the um, payment system. This also calls out to Google resources. It calls the Google geocode uh, for when you're on your, on your, say you're on your phone and you're looking for the closest branch or the closest ATM. You're going to want to be able to define that through Google, through geocode. Also, uh, it has to go out to credit bureaus, to um, or credit resources, depending on what you're doing. Maybe you're gonna, gonna look for a loan. So it has to be able to go out to the credit bureaus to, to check your credit thing. And you also have to go to an account control website. We have one customer in Europe particularly that when someone tries to open an account, they must go and call what's called world check to ensure the person that is opening the account is not on a terrorist list somewhere. And it was interesting that when we were working with them, my, my uh, coworker was there and they used him as an example and it was okay. And then they used Vladimir Putin and he came up as a terrorist. So it was pretty interesting that that actually worked. And on the, on the right side, um, we want to talk about the calling out something. Maybe you need to call out to PayPal, one of the credit bureaus. You need to be able to do that. You want um, inbound API calls from the UI into Kix with no code changes. Um, and the ATM system inbound APIs, whether they be SOAP or REST, you have to be able to handle them. Here is um, actually a working API that was used in, in one of our clients where that somebody wanted to buy stock and they would call somebody at the, control, at the uh, customer service center and they tell them that I want to buy 100 shares of IBM stock. Well, the person at the control center would have to go to multiple systems to first look up the person's account information. It would have to, um, it would have to look and call the stock market to see what the going price was. Then it would look into a different uh, 3270 process to see how much money that person had in their account. And then it would have to calculate how much stock they could buy based on how much money they, they were able to, to spend and how much the stock cost at the time. And then they tell them how many stocks they can buy. 
what they were able to do with Ivory, it was able to put that process in this flow here where they call a Kixcom area program, then they call the external web service for the stock, then they look at a BMS 3270 map to determine the amount of, uh, of funds available, and then they do a function in, within Ivory to calculate the stock, and they tell them how many, thing, how many shares they can buy. So now you took this four-step process that took somebody to call a customer service, and you now gave it in the hands of the user where they can do this from, their, from the web, from their mobile, from their tablet. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the insurance industry. This is just a mid-sized property and casual insurance, 115 years old. Uh, it processes 10 million transactions a week. Their environment, kick system of record. They also go out to the geo code. Um, when you ask who your agent is in your area, they would go and use geo code to find out who the closest agent was. They did calls through legacy database, multiple programs, kicks links. They would do other third party lookups. They also had a requirement where they had to present mobile vehicle records, proof of insurance instantly to uh, law enforcement organizations uh, wherever, you know, wherever they are. And they did that through Ivory. Uh, then business owner, locate your rep, I talked about that before. And they use actually a VB front end. And, and this is their, their VB front end. You can see it calls, it calls Ivory. And then it goes and gets something from DB2, and it presents back the employee details, um, as you can see there in the bottom left. And this is all VB and Ivory to Kix. There's also an organization that most people are aware of. Um, it's headquartered in the United States. And if anybody has ever done a um, SAT or a GMAT or a GRE or something like that, you most likely went through this, this organization because they do 50 million tests annually and they're in 180 countries. Their environment was a little bit different. It, it consisted of, uh, like I said, they also used geocode to find the, the nearest uh, testing location. They would call uh, IDMS, also linking to multiple, pro multiple programs. They would also uh, call out to get credit approval for payment and they had real-time communication with a third-party credit processor. And uh, they, already, they also had two large back-end online systems. They needed the ability to fund process funds, track it, scheduling, testing, and scoring. Um, they were both green screen um, systems, and they used the same interface. Um, they needed to have uh, SSL, so we worked with them to input um, encrypted security to, so they could meet PCI. Now this one um, is technically an IMS um, organization, but the theory and the process are pretty much the same. And, you, and you'll see um, it's a pretty interesting thing that, that we're doing out there. They have what they call a scepter system. It's used by multiple large worldwide uh, airlines. Um, they have different areas that they're working on, whether it be line maintenance, base maintenance, engineering, supply chain, and they're utilizing the web front end. There's 130 IT applications supporting this airline, from mechanics, to, like I said, supply chain and engineering, purchasing planning. The maintenance obviously is performed worldwide, so you have to have everything real time and everything in sync. And there's over 10,000 maintenance, aircraft maintenance technicians that um, are using Ivory right now. Um, normally, when you would go to an aircraft, the maintenance technician comes on, he has a big book that has all the maintenance records for that, air, that aircraft. He has to scroll through that, that paper, write down everything he did, get the captain to sign off, go back, have his boss sign off, and then enter it into the system. What they're doing now is instead of the big book, they have a Google tablet. They punch in the information on Google tablet, it immediately goes to the other two for authorizations. System is immediately updated. 
So now everything is in real time. Uh, like I said, they are uh, IMS, but uh, they used Ivory, GitHub, Jenkins, and they're, right now they're running Ivory on a Linux machine using uh, Tomcat. And this is this is the application that they were showing us. Um, they wanted to get air, aircraft detail. It came down. It gives them two options. They select the option that tells them where that aircraft is, how long it's going to be on the ground, and they can determine then as to where the best place to do the maintenance is. If the parts aren't there, they can immediately put into the system, and the parts will be flown there, and it's all real-time, all done through uh, front-end and through Ivory into their back-end mainframe. Talked about legacy application complexities. Uh, again, multiple copy books. How do you handle that? How do you handle multiple potential paths depending on what the user selects as input? How do you handle conversation or multiple code design patterns? What about the embedded screen logic we talked about? Here's another example of multiple outputs. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, there's many multiple potential outputs. Again, we're able to handle all those. Um, we're also able to handle um, the screen logic, the conversational, and all that type of stuff. Now, how does, how does Ivory fit in the mainframe? Well, on the right-hand side, we talked about the online transactions. We've done that before. We talked about um, creating singular transactions or singular APIs. Um, Ivory would sit there in between the API manager and the, and the mainframe. The API manager would, would have the information required for the front end to call that API. Ivory would run that API, whether it be an online transaction to Kix, IMS, IDMS, Natural, uh, DB2, um, but it also could go out to the external, external services, consolidate all that information, and pass it back to the, the front end as a single uh, response. Where is Ivory deployed? We give you options to deploy. Uh, you can put it on ZOS as a started task. Um, if you're worried about MIPS, you can move it off to an IFL or Linux on Z. Or you can even move it onto a Windows or Linux server. Or you can use a hybrid, which is a combination of multiple ones. We have some people that are doing very quick APIs um, on ZOS. But at the longer running APIs that would, would cause more MIPS, they would run them on. Uh, Windows, Linux, or an IFL to remove those MIPS. Also, you, you notice that there's, um, on the top, you can see all the different ways to call and get data, whether it be blockchain, cloud, mobile, um, AI, web, whatever. IBM then becomes the mainframe transportation get gateway and API organization. You have the mainframe microservices, uh, integration connectors. We do work with, if you already have APIs created um, from other products, we can call them and, and create a uh, orchestrated composite application or API uh, using them. And you can see we can do Kix, IMS, IDMS, others, and we can call external services. Now, on the right-hand side, we'll go over this in a little bit. Uh, Zoe, DB2, ZOS Connect, or an IV DBM. We, we can work with all of them. Now, what have our customers asked for? Um, the more and more people are going to REST and JSON, they're asking for Java Web Tokens. Um, they're calling out to distributed clients with organization, with orchestration, which we can do. API repositories, there's multiple ones, which ones you want. Urban code for DevOps, DB2 and also a CLI-based service creation, uh, mainly for a DevOps uh, possibility, and also uh, Zoe. Um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Zoe, uh, the open mainframe, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Java Web Tokens, this is just a flow of what it would do. You send, in, send the credentials, generate the JWT if the credentials match, 
sends a JWT and checks it back to the client to make sure that it's good. On the left-hand side is a JWT encoded, which looks like gobbledygook. On the right-hand side, it's more um, readable, and each JWT has payload has a header, the actual payload, and a signature. Here is an ivory example of JWT and how you would do it. You get the token, you call um, an engine for a pass ticket, and you go through that process there. Callable services. Callable services, people want to be able to access uh, SOAP or JSON uh, API from a callable PO1 call. Um, they want to they want to be able to call it within the uh, API of the COBOL. Now, what is needed for it? You have to generate the ser the service interface. You have to make sure all, all the TCP/IP services are okay, and you have to be able to parse parse the XML or JSON. You also need the ability to do the mapping. The mainframe programs don't know, don't care, or don't worry about whether it's REST or XML. They just want to do COBOL. And if you can hide that level of complexity from them, they're very happy about that. So here's an example of, of um, creating a, a control and flow for uh, accessing JSON or SOAP and return in COBOL or PO1 format. Um, as you can see, this is doing a, a REST version. So supporting DevOps, uh, you're able to create an API without going through uh, the Ivory GUI. And you can take an existing open API or Swagger Doc or WSDL, and you can make a callable and expose that program using the command level interface. As I just mentioned, the command level interface, the input is open API or WSDL, generates callable services, but it removes the XML to JSON complexity conversion that um, that would be required in order to, to run it. And you output of this, you get a, an Ivory serp service project that can be used. Security uh, is always a hot topic. Um, mainframe has ATTLS, a very good uh, product that will sit on top of the TCP IP stack, providing security above and beyond SSL or SSL3. But we need to be able to deal with all types of security paragraph as you create your APIs, whether it be RACF, ACF2 Top Secret, uh, the SOAP WS Star, SOAP header, Java, um, and Ivory will handle whatever security um, paradigm you want to use. This is the uh, question on APIs. Uh, once the API is created, created, you need to store them somewhere. So some of these repositories provide API management, governance, control, etc. All of them adhere to the standard, and as a, as a person who is published or reads from, you have to be able to deal with them, whether it be API Connect, uh, Broadcom, CA PIM, APIM, 3Scale, Apogee, or MuleSoft. Um, you have to be able to be able to read in and pull from. So what's next? Zoe. We talked a little bit about Zoe. Um, Zoe is uh, one of the hot topics right now. It's the open, space, open source framework that is being put in the mainframe, uh, being supported very heavily by three of the major vendors, IBM, Broadcom, and Rocket, as well as um, some of the other I IVPs. Um, we've been discussing business APIs today, but um, to provide the API for business logic and application data, but you might want to think on a normal day basis to, to consider the development of the mainframe with Zoe, you have such tools as TSO, ISPF, JCO, Rex, USS, etc. And what and Zoe is going to allow us to get into what we call system APIs or our infrastructure APIs. Tasks like submitting jobs, creating data sets, start or stopping kicks resources, kicks regions, etc. It's a whole new group of APIs that you probably haven't thought about but you'll have to deal with them as Zoe gets more and more entrenched. So if you want to be able to control both sides of the scenario, whether it be business APIs or system APIs, you'd like to have a common tool. 
Um, there's numerous presentations, documentations on Zoe, and IBM has demonstrated how you can put together scripts to do everyday tasks. But you find that you'll want to combine multiple single APIs into complex and composite API, and that's where uh, Ivory will be able to assist. DB2 REST. The current release of DB2 has provided RESTful APIs directly out of DB2. Um, we've had some customers that have expressed the need to run multiple DB2 APIs in a flow and return a single set of data back to the consumer. And as you can see with this uh, example here, Ivory was able to do that. Uh, this is an example of three DB2 APIs being called and with one of them returning data back to the customers. And these are the things you won't know until you start creating these type of APIs. What will be coming next? Uh, a lot of acronyms, I'm sure, and the mainframe participating in all of them. So we need new access methods coming along, and Kix will be able to be a full partner in them, as well as uh, Ivory will be able to also be able to be a partner in them. Here's a little bit about, <clears throat> wrap up about um, what Ivory is and what Ivory can do for you. It can create multiple transactions in a single API, as consuming multiple data sources, calling externals. You can do conditional logic, whether it's, uh, a, a connect to an IMS or a CICS region fails or not, govern security. The big part, the big issue is there's no coding. It's a drop, drag and drop uh, SDK. There's a wizard that would help you create the base APIs fairly quickly. Uh, you can share the business APIs across consumers without having the consumers need to change uh, code. Just call the API. Uh, it's easy and fast and does do agile. And uh, if you look on the left, there's, there's our Legos again. And you can see the, the bottom is the IMS EOS Connect, mainframe REST APIs, Kix Web Services, IMS Connect, and, and other things. It could be, it also could be a ivory uh, based service down there. And then you can use Ivory orchestration with the REST or SOAP to talk to the front end, whether it be web, mobile, message analytics, a message bus, data virtualization, data virtualization blockchain, uh, whatever it needs to call that API, you can call it. And Ivory will take care of the processing and presenting the data back under the covers. A little bit about GT software. We've been around for 37 years now. Uh, our first product was a BMS GT, which allowed you to, to create BMS maps without coding. It's very, very functional, still is today. Um, we have some partnerships worldwide, um, and we, we help all different types of industry create their API environment and become successful using APIs. Trevor, uh, if you want to take back, I think that's about all I have. If there's any questions.